How's it going? My name's Nico. I go by Cointrick and Cointrick Twitch Online. If you want to see more videos like this one, please remember to like and subscribe. Hit that bell so you get notified every time I upload another one of these videos. What is up, you guys? Thank you for tuning in, showing up. My name is Nico. I go by Cointrick and Cointrick Twitch Online. And today, I'm going to be talking to you guys about chartreuse. If you haven't already, remember to hit like and subscribe. Hit that bell. Get notified anytime that I go live on YouTube or post any more of these videos. Chartreuse has probably one of the most complicated histories of any kind of liquor or liqueur that I have heard of ever. So it begins in 1084. A group of cloistered monks called the Order of Chartreuse, and cloister just means that they were, they separated themselves from society. This was also a, a cenobitic order, which means that it was basically a commune inside of the monasteries. Uh, so these were hippies, but with an emphasis on solitude and contemplation. So in 1605, the monks received a gift. I'm probably going to butcher this name, uh, but they got a gift from Duke F Duke Francois Hannibal de Estres, and he was the marshal of the of King Henry the Fourth's artillery. The gift itself was a manuscript. The manuscript contained a recipe for something called elixir. Later, they would eventually call it, uh, it, or they would nickname it the elixir of long life. Unfortunately, at the time when they got the manuscript, very few people understood uh, the use of herbs and spices and maceration, infusion, extraction, and all of these other kinds of techniques. So they, they kind of reasoned out that whoever wrote the recipe originally was probably actually a 16th century alchemist. And because alchemists normally took notes and wrote all of the recipes and everything in code, they could only use part of the, of the manuscript for a very long time. And that was in the 17th century. So in the 18th century, the manuscript was sent to the mother house of the Order of Chartreuse, where they basically did an exhaustive, in-depth, deep dive study of what the manuscript meant and what all was contained inside of it. In 1737, the monastery apothecary, Frère Jérôme Malbec, decoded the manuscript. And once he decoded the manuscript, they would send monks down the mountain to sell small bottles of what was considered medicine at the time to just small villages and stuff like that. And any money that they made from that, they would use for repairs and basic necessities in, in the, the commune or the monastery or, or whatever you want to call it. And that original recipe uh, is very different from this, what we have here, what we call green chartreuse today. The original recipe was 69% alcohol. Nice. That original recipe can still be found today, though it's not gonna be labeled green chartreuse. It's actually gonna be labeled Elixir Vegetal de la Grande Chartreuse, named after the order, which was technically the order de la Grande Chartreuse. Fast forward to 1789 and the French Revolution uh, nearly eradicated and deleted the recipe for chartreuse uh, from all of history because there were only two existing copies. There was the original copy of the manuscript and basically what the monks had translated for themselves for, for their production. And those were the only two that, that they had. Both of those recipes had to change hands several times throughout the French Revolution. And in 1816, the recipe was eventually returned to the monks of the Order of Grand Chartreuse by friends of the order as the order was returned to France themselves because they had been like broken apart and exiled and all of that stuff because of the French Revolution. In 1840, uh, after the popularity of their original like medicinal small bottles that they were distributing, the monks, they decided to make a milder version of their elixir that was meant to be actually marketed as a beverage. And that's where we got green chartreuse all the way back in 1840. Shortly after that, they also made a sweeter version of that same liqueur called yellow chartreuse, which is the same proof and we also still have that today, though I do not have a bottle of it here behind my bar. There are a couple other notable variations. In 1878, they introduced a white chartreuse, which only existed for about 20 years, uh, and then it was discontinued. And then the rarest form of chartreuse is orange chartreuse, which to some accounts, was green chartreuse to which a very select kind of orange juice was added. And that is the rarest 
hardest to find chartreuse on the market today. You can still find a bottle, but the last one I saw on the market was I think 600 pounds. In US dollars would be very nearly $1,000. So how is it made? Well, the selection, crushing, and mixing of all of the herbs, spices, fruit, and botanicals happens at the monastery. Then after those ingredients have been treated and appraised at the monastery, they're transferred to a place called Voiron, where uh, they add a select liquor to them, they macerate it there, and then that is again distilled to remove any extra impurities that happen under maceration. And after that, it is aged for several years in oak. Key point, something a lot of people don't know about chartreuse, a small portion of that that they take for that aging a small portion of it doesn't actually become yellow or green chartreuse. Some of it is actually allowed to remain aging and it's chosen by the distillers there. And that becomes VEP. And I'm going to try to pronounce this, but my French is terrible. Velissimo, exceptionnellement, prolongé. And I hope that I'm pronouncing that correctly. Then each bottle of VEP is individually numbered and then sealed with wax and put in a handmade, handcrafted wooden box specifically for that bottle uh, before it's marketed and shipped out. Key point for everyone, probably what everyone has been waiting for, how does it taste? Green chartreuse is going to be bitter and botanical. Yellow chartreuse is gonna be bittersweet with some notes of honey. That's gonna be the main difference. As for white and orange chartreuse, VEP, and the original 69% elixir recipe, I can't say for sure because I've never had one of those. All right, so that's the story. That's what it tastes like. How do people normally drink this? I would probably normally drink this neat. This is a very bartender thing to do. It's, uh, it's very nearly a form of self-punishment. And eventually, though, you do just become accustomed to this flavor. You don't have to have a glass, and if you do have a glass, you do not have to have alcohol in it. But if you've tuned in and stuck around, thank you guys, I do appreciate it. Cheers to you. <sighs> Opens up those sinuses. If you do decide to drink this neat, which by the way is not uncommon, and it's not limited only to bartenders, this was originally meant to be medicine. And if you drink it neat, that bitterness and all those botanical ingredients do help this to sort of operate as like a digestif or an aperitif. So you can take this before a meal to stimulate your digestive system so that you can eat a little bit more than you normally would. Or if you feel bloated, you feel like you've maybe had a little bit too much to eat, you can also take a little bit of this neat to help settle that stomach. The way that works, the bitterness in this stimulates your gallbladder, stimulates the production of bile, and helps you break down whatever's in your stomach. It just expedites that digestive process. But let's say that's not what you're into and you don't wanna drink this neat and I do not blame you. I'm gonna tell you some cocktails that are pretty common. The top three that I have heard of in my time in the industry, the most popular one is gonna be the last word. Equal parts, gin, green chartreuse, Luxardo maraschino liqueur, and lime juice. Shaken, served up. It's the perfect balance in my opinion of like a sweet, tart and and like fruity cocktail with some like really cool bitter botanical components because of the chartreuse. Two other ones that you can make are the Naked and Famous, which is going to be mezcal, chartreuse, either yellow or green, though I recommend yellow, and then Aperol and lime juice. Again, shaken, served out. And then the third one is going to be the Bijou, which is going to be gin, sweet vermouth, green chartreuse. Very simple, stirred essentially a variation on like the combination somewhere between like a Manhattan and a martini. So a more broken down analysis of this, right? Green chartreuse specifically and yellow chartreuse as well. Uh, they have a high sugar content, they have a high alcohol content, and they're also very pungent. And what that means is that these can work as the body, the spice, and the sweetener in your cocktail or some combination of those three. So if you have a cocktail that maybe doesn't feel strong enough or you have a cocktail that doesn't have enough aroma or you have a cocktail that isn't sweet enough, chartreuse, a little bit of it, maybe a quarter to a half an ounce can fix a lot of those problems. So that's how I would use it as a modifier if I was trying to come up with a brand new drink. Guys, thank you for tuning in, sticking around, showing up. I do appreciate it. If you haven't already, I'm gonna remind you guys, like, subscribe, 
hit the bell if you wanna see more videos like this. And if you want more information on other sorts of obscure liquors, liqueurs, cordials, ingredients, tools, or just history on cocktails in general, leave those questions in the comments and I'll address them in a future video. Thank you all again, and I'll see all of you guys in the next video.